Well, thank you for talking with us today. Um, can I start by asking you just so simple question, what is DSM? What does it stand for? What does it? Well, it literally stands for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And the reason that it has that name connotes the fact that it's not been used just for diagnosis, but it's used for statistics. So this is basically a way of keeping track of uh, the number and types of diagnoses. It sort of started after the end of World War II. And so uh, we're really talking about a 50, 60 year history. Um, and the first one that really, I think, became very influential was DSM-3, which was published in 1980. And then DSM-4 was published uh, in 1994. And so there was a period of 14 years between those two. There was some change made in DSM-4 compared to DSM-3, but not that much. I think the uh, major uh, layout of the present DSM was really started with DSM-3. So who is this meant for? So I like to flip through the DSM, and I suspect it's not meant for me. Primarily, it's meant for clinicians who will use it in order to help make an appropriate diagnosis and assessment for a patient. I would want you to read the first 100 pages of the DSM-5, even if you were not a clinician, uh, and even if you were not planning to uh, read the rest of the book, because it's basically going to be uh, an introduction that will uh, tell you the changes that we've made, why we've made those changes, why certain other things we haven't done, uh, and really, I would say, a, a very transparent rationale for the, the whole DSM-5 process. Uh, a lot of attention uh, we pay to, to include uh, more than just psychiatrists in the development of this DSM. Uh, some attention was paid previously, but uh, I think this time we, uh, it was very important for us to make sure that it was really an interdisciplinary effort. And so probably the largest group, aside from psychiatrists, are psychologists involved um, in the development of it. Uh, but there are other disciplines uh, that are involved. Uh, there are other medical specialties that are involved. So for example, neurologists, pediatricians, primary care physicians. Uh, the DSM um, currently, I think, has been translated into 24 languages. So it, it is used quite a bit around the world. Um, sometimes it's used um, instead of any other diagnostic manual for mental health. Um, I think it's important to realize that uh, the DSM is developed in the United States, and it's still uh, developed, not still, but it's developed in conjunction with the fact that we have an international classification of diseases, which covers all of medical diseases, uh, and that's developed real, really by the WHO, the World Health Organization. Uh, one of the things that I think is important to realize is uh, there has been previous work with the WHO to align what the ICD process, the International Classification Disease process, does and what the DSM process does with respect to the uh, mental health and mental disorder chapters. Um, there has been some controversy around the development of the manual, both sort of uh, technical and um, and perhaps you'll correct the language here, but, but somewhat emotional over uh, different types of disorders that are indicated. Can you talk about some of those controversies? Well, no, no, sure. Um, anytime there's change, um, I think there is going to be emotionality attached to it, controversy, and the like. Um, and I think mental disorders is one where, since the language is so accessible, to all of us, um, conjures up all kinds of things when we try to change something. Um, does it mean that everybody uh, will now have a disorder because of the fact that uh, many of the terms that we use, and so when one talks about, say, anxiety, uh, all of us get a little bit anxious. So the question is, uh, what separates uh, my anxiety about uh, possibly uh, missing the train um, versus having an anxiety disorder where I really feel uh, 
totally uh, dysfunctional and I may never be make a train again. Uh, there are a number of issues that have come up with uh, if you're trying to fix something, what are the unintended consequences of fixing something? So for example, there was quite a bit of concern about changes or initial ch issues that came up with autism some time ago. Um, and uh, was there an epidemic of autism that was created by DSM-4? And uh, if we made changes to that, would we increase the epidemic? Or would we begin to try to understand it better? Uh, there are several different types of autism that have been discussed previously. Uh, one, a very high functioning group uh, considers themselves Aspies, which is Asperger's syndrome, as you know. Um, and then a group which is probably not functioning so well would be called pervasive developmental disorder. And then you would have uh, what we think about as autism in the middle, perhaps. Now, the empirical data began to suggest that what we were really talking about was a continuous dimension on several different um, important symptom domains or functioning domains, and that it was very difficult to separate out each of them in terms of a real separate disorder. And so what was decided was to recommend the fact that there would be something like autism spectrum disorder. Uh, what does it mean in terms of, um, if you will, uh, not simply benefits, but the economic uh, issues of parents being able to get help for their children, schools, um, and any kind of rehabilitation or whatever needs to go on uh, in training. Uh, so all of the, these issues came to the fore. Um, and they were discussed both in the press and they were discussed by professional organizations, inclu including, for example, say the Asperger's Foundation. Um, and at the end of the day, because this happened a couple of years ago when this was proposed, it does seem that there's, the intensity has decreased. Uh, people are accepting what we are recommending, even though it's not final yet. And there are data sets that are beginning to develop, which is suggesting that it's probably the right thing to do. I only point that out as one, um, and we could probably find many more. Very interesting. So with respect to that diagnostics issue, um, will the manual be bringing in um, uh, any of the new research, in, particularly in biology, uh, biomarkers? I was really hoping when we began, uh, in a sense, some of this work, which is really almost 10 years ago, uh, that uh, I would not be disappointed in terms of neuroscience to provide for us um, enough replicated uh, data in certain disorders that we would be able to use them as criteria. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, I probably knew that we might not achieve that goal. Uh, and again, if you think of it as a living document, uh, 5.1, whether it's two, three years after the first one comes out, uh, might have much more uh, neuroscience information in there. And uh, if one wants to really be uh, cheerful about it, uh, it's possible that uh, one or two or three or four disorders might very well have uh, criteria which uh, do represent, uh, if not biomarkers, at least biologically or objectively, um, sets of information. So for example, it is very likely that in the area of sleep disorders, we will have some quantitative measures in the criteria, which has not been the case before. So if there's anything you want to end with or um, any additional thought? Yeah. Even though the DSM-5 is structured to be used by clinicians and by people in training and by education, educators rather, uh, I think it's important to realize that one of the other things is how well does it provide a crosswalk for all of us working in research in terms of perhaps changing some of the ways that we think about these particular disorders. And uh, in a way, it is hopeful that the DSM-5 provides a kind of, if you will, transitional document uh, in thinking about uh, how uh, 
biology in the future uh, may help us with a better classification. Now, the classification may be based to some extent on, on biology and neuroscience and the like, but we must remember that the aspect of behavior will always have to be a very strong component of, uh, of the DSM nomenclature because uh, our, our patients and us and all of us uh, do not live in splendid isolation. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Okay.